Uh, so good morning, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm here in Basel, in Switzerland, where usually we have the CLINAM uh, conference. Unfortunately, this year we have to do it in a little bit of a different way. Uh, so hope you are all well. And I think we should probably just start with uh, this session this morning called Platforms of Targeting, Drug Delivery, Diagnostics, Drug Development, Design Strategies, Manufacturing of Precision Medicine. So our first lecture or speaker this morning um, is uh, Professor Hans uh, Lerach <coughs> from the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Berlin. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I will just uh, switch to the screen. Do you see me? Yes. Okay. So, um, I'd like to tell you about uh, future developments in medicine, which uh, are made possible by the enormous uh, progress in uh, analytical techniques and computing power, um, which will allow us, hopefully, for the first time to have a truly personalized therapy choice and uh, prevention strategies. The basic, oops, sorry, the basic problem we are facing with uh, is that we are all different. We have different genomes, different uh, environments, different behavior patterns, uh, different disease histories, and subtly different diseases. It's therefore not surprising that we respond often very differently to therapies and prevention measures. Um, this is... Uh, sometimes uh, very serious, it has serious consequences leading to increased morbidity and lethality, <clears throat> 190,000 deaths uh, in Europe per, uh, every year by adverse drug reactions. Um, we have an unsustainable increase uh, in healthcare cost, 4.5 billion euros per day in Europe pre-pandemic. Um, and high costs and low success rates in drug development. So, uh, sorry, uh, wrong button. Uh, the reason we can now uh, think about doing something about it is uh, to a large extent the enormous progress in molecular analysis techniques. So, different responses to drugs are based on. Um, differences in the molecular um, networks in each patient, which also differ from patient to patient. And we up to now couldn't really characterize. Uh, so from the Human Genome Project, uh, uh, where we were able to sequence one genome in 13 years and for three and a half billion dollars, we are now uh, it's a border of a situation where uh, machines have been announced of able to sequence uh, genomes for a hundred uh, for hundred dollars uh, so more than a million fold cheaper uh, and uh, than the first genome sequence this is not the only technology which has um, moved very rapidly but it is really the paradigm uh, which allows us to do um, a much more detailed characterization of patients and in particular uh, cancer patients um, in um, precision medicine approach. So we can now uh, analyze uh, as deeply the tumor, the uh, gene as a patient uh, <clears throat> by, for example, deep exome uh, of the tumor, uh, low coverage genome of the tumor, deep transcriptome of the tumor, and the same analysis, uh, obviously minus transcriptome for the patient. And that allows us to give enormously deep um, information um, on individual patients and identify uh, basically weak spots of the tumor, uh, which can be used to then uh, uh, treats a uh, patient by uh, therapy, uh, by uh, directed therapies. This we have, for example, done in a um, 
in a number of research projects. Uh, Hans, yeah. can, you, can you hear me? Because we don't see any slides. Oh, shit. Okay, sorry. Uh, I mean, you look nice, but I, <laughs> yes. I thought I had shit. Okay. Uh, is that now okay? Yep. Okay. I'm Thank really you. sorry. Uh, okay. Don't know what went wrong. Okay. So, um, oh God. okay. So we are using this deep analysis in uh, the so-called comprehensive molecular tumor analysis, a precision medicine approach to uh, help to treat patients much better. Sorry. Um, this uh, can be carried out on different levels. We carry out the extremely deep uh, analysis and that has um, enormous advantages both in uh, research projects and in uh, uh, the treatment of cancer patients who come to Alacos Theranostics to get a more deep analysis and they could get that somewhere else. This generates a report to the patients which then can be discussed uh, in the molecular tumor port and also to the doctor and lead to sometimes quite dramatic improvements in the uh, patient status. Now, um, this is uh, limited uh, not by the depth of the analysis, but by the conclusions we can draw because many things we uh, observe are too complicated to make predictions about which drug or drug combination is uh, optimal for this individual patient. We can uh, predict, for example, that if the patient has a um, protein fusion for which there is a drug available, so he might respond to that uh, protein fusion. But complex networks behave uh, in complex fashions and uh, their behavior is, is very hard to predict. And for that, we take our lead from the uh, progress in other areas. Uh, um, um, uh, enormous uh, progress we have made in avoiding mistakes in uh, solving complex problems, for example, in uh, car design or plane design, uh, where we basically only um, we cannot avoid making mistakes in complex situations, but we can avoid the consequences by making them quickly, cheaply, and safely on computer models. Um, these models are obviously uh, very different if we are trying to model a tumor or uh, um, some other tissues of the patient. What we use then is uh, uh, is object-oriented modeling systems, which can be then uh, translated into systems of differential equations for numerical uh, analysis to be able to make predictions. Um, these uh, models contain also relevant uh, tumor uh, pathways um, and uh, then can be uh, solved if we have the data and as I've shown you a precision medicine already provides us the data which we have to use to initialize the models. So a forecast model is only as good as the data put into the model and that's something which we are now uh, able to do. The last missing point is um, to be able to uh, solve the differential equations numerically, we need uh, the parameters, um, for example, kinetic constants or uh, concentrations of components in the model which are not um, available. Um, and that can uh, be done by essentially reverse engineering approaches, um, able to uh, parameterize the very large models which we need to distinguish between the different um, patients uh, in the different tumors. So 
uh, this is something we do not only have to do in a sense on the tumor because the tumor is going to be exposed to different drugs and different drug concentrations depending, for example, uh, on the gut microbiome, uh, on the pharmacogenetics. It will have different uh, consequences in the normal tissues, possibly causing um, dramatic side effects, which basically would uh, obviate using that particular drug or drug combination on a patient. And if particularly if you're using uh, immune uh, modulators, then obviously it would be very important to also be able to model the in individual immune system of the patient um, uh, to predict how the immune system will react, which uh, immune therapy will be um, leading to a success or to uh, negative consequences. So uh, we have to go in a sense from just modeling the tumor to modeling the patient, considering all the individual components which will affect the drug response. Now, if we have that uh, technology in place that can obviously be used on the current verse approach, um, the drug development, if we can predict the response of an individual uh, tum uh, of an individual patient to a specific drug, we can predict also which drug would be useful to um, uh, treat a particular subgroup of um, of patients in, uh, for example, a clinical trial. We could carry out much of the development work um, of for drugs which. Uh, leads uh, to times uh, of 12 to 14 years uh, and costs of 4 to uh, 12 uh, billion dollars per drug um, and maybe uh, <coughs> generate drugs orders of magnitude cheaper and much quicker uh, and maybe also drugs which have a much higher success rate because the drugs we have available at the moment very often medically uh, only by relatively modest improvements at often high costs simply because they end up being used on patients which do not respond to the drug. So if we can predict which patient will respond to each drug, we will be able to use all the available drugs much better. And we will be able to use many more drugs because many drugs could be approved for specific groups of patients in very small clinical trials very cheaply and quickly so we could have a much larger set of drugs uh, as options for treating as uh, individual patients. All models are wrong but some are useful. Our definition of useful is that we can uh, predict better the response to a patient uh, to a specific therapy or therapy combination, then uh, the clinical practice at the moment will do. <clears throat> and this is obviously a project which goes um, far beyond cancer. This is an approach which will sooner or later be used um, in all areas of medicine, but also in areas outside of medicine in which we have um, also biological questions uh, which are related to lifestyles, uh, sport or other behavior in which we would like to be able to take into account our own biology much better than we do now. Um, this work has been carried out over many years. Um, a particularly important contribution is Marilo Jaspo's uh, group who has developed the CMTA and implements it uh, at Max Planck and implements it at uh, Alacus Theranostics, our spin out, the group at uh, Alacus Theranostics, our medical collaborators and our computational collaborators in Munich and in Romania. Thank you very much. Sorry about the a screen sharing problem. No problem. I think we probably all have to have to become more used to this type of, of conferences. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. Um, I think you have to go out so that I can see if there are uh, any questions. Okay. 
Uh, maybe, may, maybe, maybe I just may you ask you one question. Um, so, when what do you think from a timing perspective? When will such a model be available, really, in <coughs> practice? We are very close to the. Um, to we have very good predictions <coughs> from the model on the. Uh, level of components okay. so we can um for example predict proteomics data quite well uh, the drug response data are still complex because there are many different pathways which can give you the same uh tumor growth pattern so um it is uh, it's we are also having quite a bit of success on that, but that still should be improved. So in terms of uh, taking, for example, proteomics analysis and predicting some, we have made enormous progress and that's obviously an important step to be able to uh, predict what we really want to predict, which is the drug response. Okay, so there looks like there is still a lot of work to do. Um, so yes. uh, if we, yeah, we. Uh, I think we. Uh, it's a. It's, this is the last major bottleneck, but yeah, obviously still, uh, it doesn't drop from sky, unfortunately. Clear, clear. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, so to my, uh, let's say, stream here, I do not have any other questions. Uh, at least not submitted to me. Uh, thank you very much again. So um, at that moment, we can just go, let's say, to the second presentation from uh, Professor Avi Schroeder. Uh, um, hello, Haifar, I would have to say. Hi, everyone. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Hello, Avi. <clears throat> hi, hi. I'm actually not in Haifa right now, uh, very close to Haifa. We live in a small town. Uh, a uh, small winery town that's a little south of Haifa. But uh, really, thank you for raising that. So I did want to, for people who may not be familiar, so uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you from uh, Israel, very close to the city Haifa, uh, of, uh, which is located uh, just over the Mediterranean Sea. And the city of Haifa itself is a, is a beautiful city, and I want to encourage everyone to come and, uh, and visit. We'd be very happy to host you. Uh, this uh, the upper uh, picture is the city of Haifa, and uh, uh, underneath is a, is a lot uh, where we have uh, coral reefs. Uh, Jerusalem, of course, uh, Israel has a, a lot, a lot of history that's uh, embedded, and uh, Tel Aviv, which is the city of party, great food, and uh, many people enjoy when they when they visit Israel. So uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, all of this is actually uh, embedded in a pretty close uh, drive from place to place. It's a, it's a rather small country. Um, my name is Avi Schroeder. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. And uh, I'll be presenting here work that was done uh, mainly by uh, my team. And really I need uh, to, uh, I owe my thanks to them and uh, to our funding bodies that uh, helped uh, support this research and uh, very much to our chair and, uh, and to our uh, audience here because uh, uh, for giving me the platform to speak today. I uh, initially was supposed to speak about the uh, barcoded uh, nanoparticles, but I've spoken about that in several conferences, including several CLINUM conferences. And I actually wanted to uh, uh, dedicate the talk today to personalized medicine, but from another angle. And uh, this was already highlighted in our previous uh, speaker, uh, uh, Professor Hans Lerach, uh, who, who talked about differences we have. Uh, uh, I think we're all, there are a lot of similarities, but when you look at the genetics, it's true. And when you try to uh, uh, generate personalized medicine, there are differences that need to be accounted for. And I actually wanted to uh, talk about one of the major differences uh, that affects a lot of uh, medicines. And actually, that's uh, the difference between XX and XY and uh, how gender actually can affect medication. This has been uh, overlooked in the field of nanotechnology for many years, and actually is important when we come to design uh, some of our medicines. So uh, this is a, a study that happened by serendipity, students of mine, and I'll show maybe the course of this, uh, of this study. So we, we were working uh, uh, initially on uh, liposomes for drug delivery, 
And because uh, we're in a, a meeting here of, uh, of, uh, of uh, nanotechnology and uh, clinical translation, I just want to make one shout out to a phase three clinical trial we'll be starting uh, next month, actually in 30 centers in the United States. Uh, this is a technology we developed several years ago. It's not related to the gender, but I think it's important to mention uh, today uh, because, uh, it, I mean, it's another step, I think, in this, in this field. Yeah, sorry for the, for the background noise, uh, but uh, uh, this is a uh, cartilage lubrication system that was developed by Professor Yechezkel Berenholz, Chezi, and myself. Uh, and uh, these are liposomes that are injected directly intra-articularly to patient's joint to reduce friction and wear uh, in, uh, in the cartilage. And they're actually a biomaterial uh, that is proven to be very effective in uh, lubricating the uh, damaged cartilage and improving the mobility of, uh, of patients. And uh, our initial clinical uh, trial, which was based on this formulation, I'll just uh, say it's a formulation that's composed of two lipids, DMPC and DPPC, which makes the, the formulation a, a rather flexible uh, liposome when it's uh, inserted into the, uh, into the cartilage uh, joints. And uh, uh, when, when we tested this clinically uh, in our first clinical trial, we actually show uh, we saw very good uh, uh, efficacy in regaining uh, clinical function. And another aspect which is very important these days is actually reducing pain medication. The amount of pain medication patients with chronic illnesses actually uh, 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 consume. And we saw, this is a small graph on the left-hand corner of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the screen, is, the, is a good side effect of this treatment. It's actually a reduction in the amount of pain medicine these uh, patients were, uh, uh, were consuming. So not only could they actually improve their mobility, as we saw in the clinical trial test, these are the blue bars, uh, which are rather high, 70% response uh, after 30 days, and the same was also after 90 days, they're very similar. And uh, uh, we actually had a good side effect that the patients were consuming about one third to one quarter the amount of of uh, pain medication. So here there's no medicine at all. The liposome is as if the medicine, it's injected intra-articularly and it reduces friction and wear. So it's just a shout out about a, a phase three. And I have to say, uh, I think we, we are all excited every time a, a new technology enters the clinic and uh, I, I really hope it can help many people. So, uh, uh, but, but I would wanna go back to, to the story that I started with. And this is, a, it started with a low penetration tumors. And, and we know that when we work with the nanomedicines, in some cases, we don't see a very good uptake of the nanoparticles into the, uh, into the tumor, especially, uh, especially in pancreatic uh, tumors. Uh, many times the, the particle is actually blocked outside due to a collagen matrix that doesn't allow the nanoparticle or the nanomedicine to enter effectively into the, uh, into the tissue. And we asked ourselves at the time, could we, instead of using a nanoparticle uh, only to deliver a medicine, could we also use a nanoparticle to degrade the extracellular matrix, the collagen matrix, specifically in pancreatic uh, tumors? So we took uh, liposomes and we loaded them with collagenase. Collagenase is an enzyme that is specific to collagen. And, uh, uh, and we use that as a pre-treatment pre to, uh, uh, to treat pancreatic tumors in order to increase their, uh, 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 their uptake of a second dose of nanoparticles that now will have a, a medicine inside. So again, two treatments. The first one uh, has a nanoparticle that contains collagenase that degrades the extracellular matrix, followed by a nanoparticle that actually uh, contains a medicine inside. And uh, we saw that we actually were uh, effective in degrading the extracellular matrix. And just to show what a barrier we have in pancreatic tumors, uh, this is in two papers that we, we recently published. Um, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, a pancreatic uh, uh, tumor inside the pancreas. All the blue you can see inside this, uh, uh, inside this tissue, all the blue stain is actually uh, a... Is, is a staining of the collagen inside, a Mason 3 home uh, stain of the collagen inside the fiber. So actually a huge, huge barrier that we have compared, if you look to uh, the right hand, to the left hand side of your screen, where there's very little collagen inside the, uh, the, the pancreas. And what we showed is that when you deliver 
when you deliver collagenase to degrade that collagen fiber, you can actually open up the pancreas and allow the penetration of medicines into the, uh, uh, into the pancreas in a better manner, which improved or extended the life of the mice that were treated, reduced the tumor size. And we saw also, we tested the uh, different factors of safety. And, uh, and we saw that this technology actually uh, uh, has, has promise uh, for, uh, uh, for, future, for future work. But during these studies, an interesting phenomena came up. So we wanted to image the particles as they enter the pancreas. And uh, uh, Maria and Asaf, the students who were working on this, uh, on this project, uh, went to the MRI and they took nanoparticles that they actually loaded with uh, gadolinium. And they uh, came up with the image and they said, Avi, listen, we have a strange biodistribution uh, pattern here. And initially, uh, I thought we're looking at accumulation of the nanoparticles or the gadolinium uh, in uh, some aspects of the urinary tract or maybe the bladder. But they luckily were very persistent and, uh, and we looked at it slightly deeper and we actually found out that uh, when we took out the anatomy books for mice, that we were looking at nanoparticles that were accumulating in the ovaries of the mice. So uh, the nanoparticles were accumulating in the ovaries. And then there was another actually uh, aspect to this uh, story, or almost a detective story, I would say, is that we found out that these mice, these female mice were actually held uh, in, a, in a new location in the animal house next to male mice. Now, mice uh, have an ovulatory cycle that is induced uh, by the presence of a male. Uh, and, and here, the, uh, 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 the people that were handling the female mice and the male mice, uh, in some cases, handled the male mice first and then the female mice uh, later. What caused some mix inside the, uh, inside the cages, not of the mice themselves, but even of the bedding, that was enough to induce an ovulatory cycle in the mice, which later on we learned also affected or impacted the uptake of the nanoparticles into the ovaries of these, uh, of these mice. And uh, uh, so, so the ovulatory cycle of the mice uh, is, uh, it, it has similarities to the human ovulatory cycle besides being uh, uh, induced, which is different. And it has four stages, the estros, proestros, estros, and metaestros. And, uh, uh, and, and, and it actually uh, describes the maturation, the maturation of the, uh, of the egg in the, uh, in the ovaries. And this actually brought us to a question, do nanoparticles actually act differently uh, in, for men and for, uh, uh, and for women? Or are there situations where a medicine will work differently for men and women? And we know for small molecule drugs, gender or sex actually plays a very important role in the metabolism of certain uh, medicines where you don't account only for the body weight, uh, you need to also account for other factors uh, uh, that, that differ between, uh, between men and women. And the interesting thing was that we actually saw that when we uh, uh, introduced the nanoparticles to mice that were in the ovulatory cycle, we actually saw major accumulation of the nanoparticles in the ovaries and in the uterus. So when the mouse is injected with the nanoparticles intravenously, they actually accumulate in the ovaries and in the uterus uh, in a, an extended manner when the mouse is in it uh, when, uh, during the ovulatory uh, cycle. More specifically, uh, what we also uh, accounted for is of course the increase in blood flow to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to, uh, uh, to the ovaries during the uh, uh, during the estro stage, which is uh, the, the culmination or the peak of the, uh, of the menstrual cycle in the, in the mouse. And when we actually stained for it, we saw that an increase of uh, blood flow or an increase of, uh, uh, of blood vessels around the, uh, around the follicles is actually supporting the follicles during this important stage uh, uh, for life. And most likely the nanoparticles actually can extravasate from these blood vessels during this period and actually accumulate in the ovaries. And this of course can have positive or negative, uh, or negative effect. And specifically, uh, uh, as my time is short, I'll just uh, show uh, uh, several aspects uh, of, of this uh, manner. Uh, one is that nanoparticles can accumulate. There is a size cutoff. So we see that nanoparticles that are smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter accumulate more efficiently inside the ovaries. 
uh, compared to nanoparticles that are larger. We looked at nanoparticles 200, 100, uh, 80, and 50 nanometers in diameter, and we actually showed that or saw that the nanoparticles that were larger uh, accumulated less efficiently inside the uh, inside the ovaries. So we do have a size cutoff uh, of uptake into the uh, into the ovaries during the estrous uh, uh, stage of the uh, of the uh, ovulation. More interestingly, we actually saw uh, that the uh, the nanoparticles accumulate around the follicles. The, the, the pink region you can see in these, uh, in these uh, histological cuts actually show the nanoparticles bedding around the, uh, around the follicle uh, with the egg inside and actually waiting there on the border, staying right outside the, uh, the follicles, which then we found out actually plays an important role in the activity and also in the possible toxicity of the, uh, of the nanoparticles. Specifically, when Maria studied the, uh, the effect or of the nanoparticles on, uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the eggs themselves, she took healthy mice and she injected them during the ovulatory cycle with nanoparticles that contain doxorubicin inside of them, liposome doxorubicin. And she showed that for the first 24 hours, actually the free doxorubicin was much more toxic to the ovaries compared to the liposomal doxorubicin. However, she was persistent and she continued for one additional day and she saw that after 48 hours, the toxicity of the doc like Pazoma doxorubicin already equaled itself to the free drug. And the reason was that it took time for the nanoparticles to accumulate and then they opened up and spilled their medicine into the, uh, uh, into the follicle and actually affected the toxicity on the eggs of, uh, uh, that we had inside. So here in this case, uh, a nanoparticle and it is able to deliver the medicine uh, to, to that site. However, in some cases we see an extended or a later uh, toxicity, which, uh, which can be actually negative to our, uh, to our, clinical, uh, uh, to our clinical goal. And, and, and she actually uh, took this on and, and, and found that when uh, we looked at the long-term fertility effect of the nanoparticles, on the, uh, on, the, on the mice, we actually saw a negative long-term fertility effect of the nanoparticles inside the ovaries compared to the free drug, meaning that these mice were less able to become pregnant, the mice that were treated with the nanoparticles with the medicine, but more than that also, uh, they had less live births compared to mice that were treated with the free drug, meaning that we had a long-term effect of toxicity inside, uh, inside the ovaries. The positive side, as I'm, uh, I passed my time right now, uh, the positive side of this uh, technology was uh, when we were less concerned about fertility, but more concerned about efficacy, we were able to actually improve the activity against ovarian tumors. So if we wanna treat a tumor during uh, the ovulatory cycle, we get extended uh, uptake of the nanoparticles with a medicine, which brings more medicine to the site of the tumor and then we saw a longer life uh, of, of the mouse, uh, uh, shrinkage of the, ov of the ovarian uh, tumor or tumors of the ovary, I should say. And uh, 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 so I'll just sum up here with this, uh, with this slide and say that using nanotechnology, one gender has to be taken into account. Uh, within gender, also looking at the, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the menstrual cycle is very important uh, when we come to treat with nanoparticles as we see accumulation of the nanoparticles in the uh, ovaries and in the uterus, which are important uh, organs, uh, extremely important organs for life and, 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 and for the patient uh, uh, herself. And, and more importantly is when we weigh the benefit and cost, we should actually ask ourselves, what is the goal of the treatment and when should we actually treat in a better manner? Thank you very much and sorry for uh, running uh, uh, two minutes over time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Avi. Uh, and I would like also to thank you uh, for the nice pictures you showed us in the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, we'll take a little bit more time until we can really travel again. Yeah. Um, so let me just check uh, uh, if there are questions from the colleagues. Okay. Um, so uh, from Michael Keller, great talk. What about a non-tumor associated collagen throughout the body? where the liposomes are accumulated, how much it is affected by the collagenesis? What is the therapeutic window? 
Yeah, so we treated uh, 24 hours, we treated with the collagenase nanoparticles 24 hours before treating uh, with the medicine. Um, the therapeutic window, we, uh, I, I assume, okay, I don't know uh, how fast the collagen rebuilds um, is uh, probably, I, I would assume we tested after 24 hours, I would try not to treat more than 48 hours. That's a great question. Uh, we didn't test how fast the collagen rebuilds inside the site. And uh, maybe it brings to a question, should the two be given even uh, almost uh, together, let's say four hours apart. We did want to bring it into a clinical scenario uh, where in some pa patient centers, the patient can come in the morning and others really, it can be a whole day spending there. So I think that's a great point to actually uh, look at that. I Perfect. have a second question for you here on the liposomes from Bruno uh, Samento. Did you consider to include any bioactive payload into liposomes for cartilage repair? So th that's a great question. Um, we did. And I have to say that I'm uh, happy that at the time, today I, I would maybe think different, that at the time we didn't do it. And, and, and I'll say why. The, so when we ran our first clinical trial, um, the FDA looked at it or the regulatory bodies looked at this uh, uh, technology as a medical device. Uh, the liposomes were looked at as a medical device and not a drug. And that allowed us to enter clinical trials very rapidly uh, after showing safety uh, and efficacy in a, in a, in a preclinical uh, manner. So um, uh, it, ha not having a medicine actually uh, made uh, this uh, track faster. Um, I think from, a, from an engineering or a biological perspective, adding a, a therapeutic uh, agent into these uh, liposomes today would make a lot of sense and could also help other aspects of the disease and maybe even curing it in a better manner. Uh, for us, I have to say that for that specific uh, uh, treatment, not having a medicine actually made, a, uh, made our track to the clinic very fast and, uh, uh, and, and the same now also for the phase three. Okay, um, thank you very much for thank your you. nice lecture. So we're coming uh, to the next part and uh, I'm calling here for Professor Gerrit Borchardt from the Geneva Lausanne School of Pharmacy in Geneva. So not so far away from myself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, actually, I'm speaking from my office in Geneva, a uh, country Switzerland that was not mentioned on Avi's uh, map. So that's where we are. We still have access to our labs for the moment, but that is uh, probably changing in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm gonna, I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see this? Yes, we can see it, but uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, Thank you. so like Avi, I changed my title a little bit. Uh, I uh, deleted the uh, reference to um, the liver cancer. Um, we have some experience in liver cancer uh, concerning the uh, transarterial uh, chemoembolization treatment, which we did before. Now, we are focusing here in this uh, work on activating the immune system to fight the tumor tissue. Um, this ultimately would go into like a taste strategy, but we're not there yet. And I will uh, only show you like the, the beginning of this project. Um, Maria and Olivier are uh, the people who are also involved in this project. Now I'm also only here to report on this. Now, um, the other's work is basically what we are using is this um, CGAM, but we'll later, uh, the stance here is CGAM as a part of the innate immunity, it's a ligand for the uh, sting system, the stimulator of interferon genes, uh, can activate um, antigen presenting cells. So what we're <clears throat> imagining is um, to use a carrier, a polymer carrier, apply this either intratumorally or intravenously uh, to the patient, then that would be taken up, this carrier together with the CGAM would be taken up into the cells, the dendritic cells, uh, you know that so how this works by endocytosis, uh, disassembly in the endolysosomes, and then the CGAMP would um, search its receptor here, which would be recruited at the endothelial, uh, endoplasmatic reticulum. Um, then you would have the activation here of the interferon beta by activation of these genes, and then you would have an activation of the immune system. Uh, this goes further on to lymph node, then you have this presentation of new antigens, hopefully of the um, cancer new antigens to T cells and activation of T cells and these CD8 plus T cells would then 
um, fight uh, the cancer there. Now, uh, what we've done, uh, just as an introduction, CGAMP, this is this oligodinucleotide, 2,3-CGAMP. Uh, it is a dinucleotide which is prone to hydrolytic degradation once it's introduced into the bloodstream, of course, or into a biological environment. So we need a carrier for this. It's also highly negatively charged. So the cellular uptake is relatively low, although there have been some active uptake been identified recently. There's a um, publication from 2019 by the reduced folate transporter that you see here. And there is also a bystander effect if you, you know, have um, CGAMP in one epithelial cell or one uh, uh, cell, it can be transferred um, to another cell through the gap junctions in between these cells. So this kind of bystander effect that was shown at least in vitro in, I think it was in, um, in raw cells in, in this point. Now, um, what we've done, the carrier polymers we're looking at are polyethylenemines on one hand and the uh, PAMAN dendromeres here on the other, other side. So these are branched polyethylenemines uh, of 1.2 and 10 kilodalton we uh, were looking at, and also linear polyethylenemines of uh, 4KD and 25KD. Right now in this presentation, for lack of time, um, I will focus on the linear PEI and the 25 kilodalt molecular weight uh, for now and show you some results that we have obtained so far. Um, the preparation, uh, nanoparticle preparation you see here is relatively straightforward. We have an ionic gelation method. It was first described for, I think, chitosan nanoparticles. We do this in 6.5 pH and PBS, phosphate buffered saline. We add dropwise the CGAMP to PEI by the vortexing, and we let it uh, stand to have the uh, complex formation going on over time course of 30 minutes at uh, room temperature. And then we uh, try different ratios, and we're focusing here in this presentation on the one-to-one -one and two-to-one ratio, N to P, meaning the amine groups against the phospho Phospho groups, phosphate groups in the uh, CGAMP, and this is of course the polymer here. So uh, a couple of things we did so far. Uh, we did some physical chemical characterization. We looked at efficacy and toxicity always in vitro for now. You see here a couple of these, um, what people may call, and Sven Evan probably would call the uh, critical quality attributes of these nanoparticulate carrier systems like size and zeta potential. Look a little bit at the shape by um, visualization imaging methods. We looked at media stability when we are performing these in vitro experiments. The influence of pH, I will come back to this later, and the stability in serum when we introduce these carriers into a biological system. We looked at preliminary at encapsulation efficiency a little bit, and as I said, the toxicity, the biological effects um, in vitro for now. Um, so this is uh, a lot of information in one slide. You see here the uh, electron microscopy images. This is for one-to-one -one and this is for two-to-one ratios. You see here the Z average. <clears throat> Uh, in different media, so this is in water, when we measured it in PBS, you see that the, the size is pretty nice, about 300 nanometers, and also the PDI is, well, let's say acceptable for this. When we introduced that in DMEM without FCS in this case, uh, it got a little more, uh, the PDI got a little more higher. Now for the two to one, we also saw these um, differences, not as much uh, expressed as for the one to one ratio. Um, we also had a, a zeta potential here of these ones, like 3.6 uh, millivolts. And in the case of uh, the two to one, it was 7.8, which is kind of logical. So there was no significant difference in size and PDI for the three, um, three different media. Uh, PDI and the standard deviation appear to be lowest in, in PBS. And based on the uh, scanning electron microscopy, these two and one formulations tend to aggregate more, which is also corroborated by these measurements in DLS. Um, now, the influence of pH is interesting because, um, you know, these particles are taken up by the cells. They go into the endolysosomal compartment. They have to do an endolysosomal escape. Uh, and this is why PEI has this um, function that if you complex this with a CGAM, you get something here, it's 6.5, like a 
like a rather dense um, complex. And if you then lower the pH of four to five in the endolysosomal compartment, this starts swelling and starts um, affecting this endosol endosomolytic effects. So we, what we measured here uh, is the size and the zeta potential of these different um, carriers uh, under different conditions, pH six, five, and four. And you see these things start swelling really a lot at pH four. And also uh, the zeta potential um, is different between pH five and pH six. So we're like confident, confident that, you know, we would have some uh, endosome escape of the particles because of this uh, buffering capacity and all these amino acid, amino uh, functions are taken on, are being protonated. That leads to a particle size increase and it leads to a um, burst release from the endosomes. Now the stability in BSA is interesting. Um, are they like, if we introduce that into bloodstream or into the tumor, would that be uh, stable? We incubated uh, the one-to-one -one formulation in this case with albumin, a physiological blood concentration of 40 grams per liter, but also we uh, tuned it down to 0, 5, 10, and 20 gram per liter of uh, albumin. And you see, we could nicely um, distinguish between the albumin signal here in the DLS and the different nanoparticles. So um, this red line here was um, the, um, the size of PBS, so the particles in PBS, and it goes down as you see here for the different BSA um, concentrations. Um, then we did uh, encapsulation efficiency and these are preliminary uh, data. What we did, we uh, spun down the particles in a viva spin where we basically filtrated this and then we fil uh, analyzed the filtered fraction. So that was an indirect measurement uh, according to the UPLC conditions that you see here. We could determine for the encapsulation efficiency See for a one-to-one -one linear PEI 25, something like 59, 60%, and for the other one, 75%, which is uh, not optimized at this point, but um, it's going in the right direction as we think. Uh, toxicity, um, we looked uh, by uh, facts at different um, um, states of these cells. So we incubated for two hours, uh, 0, 0.0 milligram per mil PEI sting. Uh, ligands uh, in PBS on raw cells, um, macrophage cell line. And we looked at healthy cells, we looked at early apoptosis, we looked at late apoptosis and necrosis. And as you see here, this is for the sting ligand only. This is for the linear uh, P25, only the polymer. You see that there is not much difference actually uh, between these groups. However, we see some very significant differences between the healthy cells, early, early apoptosis and so forth. So basically um, we have a high percentage of healthy cells after this treatment, uh, like up to 70, 80%, even with these two uh, ratios that we were testing here. Um, then we looked at another biological effect. As I said, um, this um, sting ligands are activating the interferon beta secretion. In dendritic cells, they are also activating the expression of CD80, 86. Um, molecules on the surface of these activated major dendritic cells. So what we did, we measured the interferon beta release and we measured the expression or increase of expression of the CD886. And this is the, uh, <clears throat> this is the interferon beta only for all the media. We always find some concentration of uh, interferon beta for the sting ligand alone in solution. We already have something like 120. Uh, units per milliliter, this is probably due to the uptake by this receptor that I just mentioned. We have to see whether this receptor is actually, uh, present in these cells, in these bone marrow derived uh, dendritic cells. However, if we uh, then <coughs> incubate with our two formulations, uh, one to one and two to one, we have an increase to uh, three times, almost four times um, the level we have here. We're looking at um, the um, C80, 86 expression, you see that we have a rather very significant increase in the expression of these um, proteins on the dendritic cells, up to 51 folds for the two to one, um, for the two to one formulation in case of the CD86 here. So there is some activation going on, at least in vitro. Now the conclusions that we can draw 
is that uh, we have four different polymers tested right now. We are looking into more of them. As I said, I mentioned the PAMAM, which we probably will also um, use in the future. We have a formulation with the uh, linear PEI-25, uh, preferred in terms of physical characterization, encapsulation efficiency, toxicity efficacy balance in vitro, and we're working on the PN ratio to be optimized. So the next steps are uh, quite logical. We look at the efficacy confirmation. So we want to uh, repeat these uh, experiments and really confirm that we do have an activation there in terms of uh, CD8086. Completion of particle characterization, we're looking at AEF4, which becomes now the standard uh, more or less method for the characterization of these particles. We're also looking at NTA to confirm our DLS data, which uh, sometimes can be uh, misleading. Uh, I also said that, you know, we want to activate the uh, immune system uh, to fight a tumor and their tumors are, can be categorized into cold tumors and hot tumors. So cold tumors are not very immunologically active. So, so we want to turn them into hot tumors. And these are characterized by different uh, phenotypes of macrophages, the M2 and M1. And for this, uh, we're using currently a um, melanoma model in vivo because melanoma is a good example of a so-called cold tumor. We want to you know, use our uh, formulations in order to turn this into a hot tumor with a high immunological activity. Please me uh, to thank you all for your um, attention and um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Borchert. Uh, let me um, let me just see if we have any questions here. Um, Hi, can can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, so I really love the talk, and uh, this is uh, bringing back uh, PEI, which is an amazing molecule, I think, with uh, a lot of uh, functionality. And I wanted to ask uh, uh, how you balance, uh, so you have an immune response, and how you balance, uh, or how you think to balance uh, toxicity uh, with, uh, with activity yep. and uh, with the immunogenicity. So how do you run those experiments, uh, and, and, and what's your thought about that? Uh, I would really love to hear. So, so we have like a, um, how do you say that, a, um, a plan how to uh, get there, um, like an algorithm more or less. What we do is we, we uh, already selected the, uh, the one I was talking about, the P25, a PI25, uh, like a linear, because we also looked at the branch and we looked at toxicity in vitro. So we excluded some of these and we made the selection right there and then. Now what we're doing is, uh, as you saw, we are looking at activity and toxicity and we try to get this balance also by um, improving the P and N ratio that we are, we're looking at. Uh, we also have some more ideas, which I do not want to talk about. My uh, student was not allowing me to do that, but we have some more um, ideas in order to, to increase effic efficacy in, in the um, transfection and also the targeting of these, uh, these uh, systems. Yeah, thank you very much. Beautiful. I mean, thank beautiful study. I'm sorry. Final, final word. Uh, what we'd like to do is, um, as I said at the beginning, combine the taste, the transarterial embolization. So what we are imagine imagining is to load these particles that I just described with the beads that are, we're using for the uh, transarterial um, blocking. So we put this right into the tumor. So we think that the uh, side effects might be a little more limited uh, by this physical targeting to the tumor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there. Okay, Dr. Ivan Boris from the Department of Biotechnology and Nanomedicine in Trondheim in Norway. Are you there? Okay. Uh, I'm here, yeah. Yes, we can okay. see you. We can see your screen. <clears throat> so all good? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to talk here. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about an ongoing EU project, a, quite a recent project, and then I'm going to delve a little bit into uh, the particular challenges of um, therapeutic mRNA in terms of characterization. So the project is called EXPERT. <clears throat> it's funded under the H2020 program. Um, it's about 
as the title says, expanding platforms for efficacious mRNA therapeutics. So it's about platformability of the of the delivery systems. Now, I think we are quite familiar with the with the challenges uh, for uh, RNA drugs. So they they need to, as all non medicines, they need to be targeted to the right tissue. They need to be delivered intact into the cytoplasm, and you need to avoid adverse effects like immunogenicity. So the project objectives of the expert project is, first of all, to develop mRNA nanomedicines. Uh, then it is to produce them in a quality by design approach. Uh, eventually we want to scale it up under GMP and get towards clinical translation. Uh, we are um, in the process of uh, of uh, getting into a first-in-man clinical study with um, mRNA nanomedicines for immunotherapy, so specifically triple negative breast cancer. And in parallel, we are also investigating uh, this as a therapy for heart failure patients. Just very, very briefly, uh, so the project has 11 partners. It's coordinated by Ray Schifflers at UMCU. Uh, it started late 2019. Um, and uh, early 2020, uh, Moderna was the quickest vaccine developer ever into uh, phase one clinical with an mRNA-based vaccine. That um, that wasn't lost on anyone. It kind of showed the showed the relevance of the project. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the strategy is as follows. So the primary indication is triple negative breast cancer. We have as an additional indication, heart failure. So infarction, uh, where the heart tissue actually dies. We have three delivery solutions that we want to pursue. So it's the, the most established ones, which is the LNPs, uh, which we've already heard quite a bit about here. We have uh, one that is uh, a bit more exploratory, which is cell penetrating peptides. Uh, complex to the mRNA, and then the most, uh, well, should I say blue sky, is the extracellular vesicles. They they show um, tremendous transfection efficiency, but they are really hard to load. So um, it's based on a complementary uh, risk-benefit profile, where we, we have some things that we know will work, we have some things that are more exploratory. For targeting, we intend to attach nanobodies to the surface of the nanocarriers. So, so basically, as you can see in the in the figure, we're talking about a, a different uh, different phases of the project. So it's one about designing the the nanocarriers or the nanocarriers platforms. Then it's about one about production and quality control. And I'm going to get back to the quality control issue here. So we have gone for the microfluidic manufacture. Uh, we have gone for the quality by design approach for this. And eventually, you need to ask yourself. Does it perform according to what you want? You need to test safety and you need to test efficacy. Uh, then there is the clinical study plan. And overall, obviously, you want to, if, if you're designing a platform, you want to be in contact with those who actually could have a benefit from using your platform all the way from the beginning. So the primary indication was triple negative breast cancer. Uh, the, immunostimulatory mRNA payload that we are intending to use is the Trimix. Now that is exclusively licensed to Eterna, which is partner in the project. It's a, as the name says, a mix of three different mRNAs. Usually this is given together with a um, antigen encoding mRNA. Uh, in this case, we are using the endogenous complex mix of already present tumor antigens and the new epitopes in the solid tumors. So it's an intratumoral injection in this case. Uh, the Trimix is originally designed as an ex vivo product. So you, you do ex vivo transaction uh, and it's already classified by EMA as an advanced therapy product. So it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, progressed in the, in the regulatory landscape. Uh, we've now heard a couple of times already the um, intention of turning cold tumors into hot tumors. Uh, that's about recruiting dendritic cells, uh, activating them 
because this is required for T cell infiltration and priming in the tumors. So the problem is that cold tumors, they are largely resistant to the immunotherapy that has shown such tremendous effects in some cases, uh, but unfortunately not all. So <clears throat> what about the platform ability? Um, mRNA therapeutics seem pretty ideally suited for delivery platforms. So why is that? Well, mRNA as a therapeutic has some generic needs for protection. Uh, it's a really fragile molecule. It needs to be transported through the bloodstream where there's lots of nucleases present. It needs to go into the cytoplasm intact. So the delivery challenges are almost identical for uh, all mRNAs. They are large, they are polyamnionic. And the, most notably, the, the overall physical chemical characteristics of the mRNA molecules are almost independent on the nucleotide sequence. And this is important because from a FISCAM point of view, you can treat them as basically one molecule. Uh, they are the same, roughly the same polarity, chain charge, uh, roughly the same size. Uh, that's a bit of a simplification, but they, they're still big enough that you can consider it the same. And they are um, very different from small molecules, obviously. So you have a range of possible applications, but the payload or the, the API behaves very similarly. So you can, you can use mRNA to make therapeutic proteins, obviously. You can use it to make more of your uh, therapeutic proteins, intensified effects. You can make the correct protein if you have a, a aberrant a gene present or that makes a, an aberrant protein. You could inject the correct mRNA and produce the wild type protein. You can very, make very large proteins in vivo. Um, you can make proteins that were never in the body in the first place. For instance, we have heard talks about delivering the CRISPR-Cas system. You can make it in places where it has never been made before. Or you can make it um, in locations, like in cellular locations where it hasn't been before. So <clears throat> for, for platformability, um, it's, it's about having different ways of delivering mRNA, right? Uh, you, could, you could start out with, with the ex vivo transfection of mRNA and then injection of, of cells, uh, as we are looking at the intratumoral formulation, but obviously you want to have a you, you won't have delivery platforms that can be used also, for instance, for intracardiac or most notably intravenous. There, there is a lot of delivery routes and some of the challenges for these routes are generic across them. This is what we call platform challenges. And then obviously when you get closer towards the clinic, there are some very uh, particular things that you need to address for each of these delivery routes. Um, as I said, that <clears throat> we, um, we started late uh, 2019, uh, and by the time I was signed up for the, the Cleanham conference, we thought that, yeah, uh, so that's, uh, that's well in time to have lots of nice results for the, for the conference. And then obviously came the pandemic, as you all know, um, we have been um, hampered a little bit in terms of progress since then, uh, but we have started to accumulate some results. And now um, here is a screening of LNP formulations that we have been performing. So uh, I've um, boxed out the different lipids since that's proprietary. But what you can see in the top chart here is the size and the PDI for the different formulations uh, that are listed along the x-axis. And similarly, you have the uh, in vitro CD70 expression from these delivery systems in the corresponding boxes at the, at the lower level. So. So it's really just to see, show you that <clears throat> a, you can't necessarily predict from, for instance, from size, what is going to be efficient to delivery or efficient expression of your mRNA payload. So there is a, there is a significant need to actually perform screening of formulations here. Now, <clears throat> um, I want to delve a little bit into the characterization since uh, that's a bit of a specialty. Um, Nanomedicines have some clear particularities. Um, they, um, they are obviously nano-sized objects. So they are a structured form of chemistry. 
quite different from uh, soluble small molecule drugs. Now, the, the more classical nanomedicines, if you can say that, because it's still a, a novel field of, uh, of medicine, they traditionally contain small molecule drugs. And for this, uh, the nanomedicine characterization laboratories, both the NCI, NCL in the US, and the EU NCL in Europe, have developed some assay cascades to characterize them. Uh, we, we started out with uh, typically a pre-screening just to check that these were endotoxin-free, that the size was what it's supposed to be, that the uh, that, uh, sterility was what it's supposed to be, and that the drug loading was roughly near what it was supposed to be. Then we followed a progressive characterization uh, from uh, physical chemical to in vitro and eventually to in vivo. Uh, now, a lot of the characterization for in vitro and in vivo is reasonably similar because, and it, it might even be easier because <clears throat> generally you want to encode a protein. As long as you have an assay to actually detect the protein, you're good to go for the, to, to measure the translational efficacy. Then obviously you will need to, to measure the in vivo, in vivo efficacy. Uh, but that's, that's not different really from small molecule uh, drugs. So, there are some specific challenges for mRNA nanomedicines. Um, it's not so much about things like surface charge or size of nanocarriers. That, that is more or less sorted, those methods we have. Uh, that's what I call easy or easy in inverted commas. It's, uh, it's not really necessarily easy, but at least there are established methods out there. So if you're looking at LNPs as the most mature vehicles for delivery of mRNA, uh, they encapsulate the mRNA to protect it from the environment and also to protect the environment from adverse immunogenicity on the way to the actual site of action. <clears throat> but as I said, methods exist for, for some of the more generic challenges. And then there are some that are, some challenges that are specific, they are new and they are actually pretty hard. Um, so mRNA is huge. It's long, like a high molecular weight, and it's a long, a molecule that is exposed to shear. It's charged, it's highly charged, polyanonic. It's really fragile in all senses of the words and nucleases are really everywhere. If you don't take care, it will be eaten into small pieces immediately. And moreover, you are really depending on that the, in the whole mRNA molecule more or less is actually intact. You can't do changes to any small parts of it without changing the effect. So. It's, um, I don't know if you've ever tried to ship a, a glass chandelier from, uh, from Venice across Europe, because I have, I still don't know exactly how that, how that went well, it did, but it took a copious amounts of bubble wrap. So it's a, it's a little bit the same thing. You have something big, fragile, that you want to, want to deliver, and it's, it's hard to wrap it, um, but somehow it works. So it's a, it's a bit of a tricky and light because you really want to, you want the quantity, so the drug loading, and but you also simultaneously want the integrity, the sequence of those molecules that has been loaded, which is, it might sound, um, it might sound obvious, but, but this is more challenging than you would think compared to small molecules. Some challenges that comes to mind. Uh, you could use amplification-based approaches to quantify. Um, that's not entirely covering chemical degradation. If you, if you have some small base alterations in your mRNA that could affect biological activity, they might not be picked up during the reverse transcription. These, thing, these are things like oxidation, alkylation, and deamination. Uh, the fragility of mRNA is distributed throughout the whole molecule. That's kind of opposed to what you find for small molecule drugs. So you have paclitaxel in the upper right corner here, and you know pretty much where paclitaxel is going to fall apart. There are some ester bonds that are more fragile than others. You, you pretty much know which breakdown products you will get if you have degradation. That's not homogeneous in, um, in an mRNA molecule. You get all kinds of degradation products. Sequence errors could actually be detrimental to the point of dangerous. If you have a, uh, a, a base alteration in a uh, CRISPR uh, setup where you actually want to modify genes in the cells where you're delivering. 
Now you come to the interesting case of <clears throat> stoichiometry. If you have more than one mRNA, you want to have the same stoichiometry ideally in each nanoparticle. So you don't have all your mRNA type one in one set of nanoparticles and all your mRNAs type two in another set of particles, because that would not really make delivery very easy. Um, also, eventually when you get to the biological background, the pharmacokinetics and the biodistribution needs to be measured in a massive background of RNA. A really a massive background. So, so to, to pick out something small that is virtually identical to a huge background is tricky to say the least. So the analytical approach that we have been adopting here is to pick up a set of complementary methods. Um, these are things like very non-specific quantification like uh, the ribogreen kit, the fluorescence, we have been looking at single nucleosides as separate compounds. So to look at that as a purely chemical analytical problem to see if you have degradation on the single nucleotide level. Uh, if you use LCMS, you can do this in a very sensitive fashion. Bulk integrity. So basically migrating your mRNA in a gel can say something about whether most of your compound is the right size. Uh, but as anyone has run a gel knows, <clears throat> they look a bit like this and you don't have super clear bands most of the time. Bulk sequence with, for instance, with qPCR will, <clears throat> will say, uh, tell you something that the, most of the sequence is correct. You can use things like the branched DNA assay to um, uh, the hybridization based assay to pick up down to single, single molecules. And of course, the holy grail is to be able to do single molecule sequencing on the mRNA payloads. We are also looking into that. Um, I'm running towards the end of my talk, but uh, uh, in terms of regulatory requirements, this is also a bit of an unmapped area. Uh, what are the critical quality attributes that need to be defined for mRNA therapeutics? And here there is clearly a need to have a um, dialogue with the regulators. Uh, it's nanomedicines is a relatively novel field and therapeutic mRNA even more so. so. So I would really encourage everyone to interact with the regulatory authorities as early on as possible uh, in this very, very exciting field of therapy. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Sven. Uh, a very nice talk. Uh, we have questions from uh, the audience. Um, yep. so if I can ask a question, please. Yes, of course. The um, <clears throat> formulations that you showed on slide seven, were these all made by microfluidics? And how um, does this microfluidics um, method um, contribute to the uniformity of the particles that you have in terms of also of the regulatory um, discussions? Well, yes, uh, we have chosen to to use microfluidics exactly for that purpose because the reproducibility and the robustness of production. Uh, it has been one of the challenges for LNPs previously at least to, to have low PDI, to have re reproducibility both in time and uh, between labs. So, um, so uh, yes, microfluidics has been, um, has been chosen as the, hmm. the dedicated production means. All right, thank you. Um, so I have one other question here for you. Uh, when you talk about regulatory authorities, uh, are there at all already regulations for this type of therapy based on mRNA? Well, there, sorry. <clears throat> well, I mean, there, there are therapeutic mRNAs in clinical trials. So obviously uh, it, it's not a completely a complete desert, uh, but I, I do know from personal communication that it is seen as a challenging regulatory field. Okay, so meaning that will take uh, probably more in terms of years than uh, of months in that case. Well, I mean, it's all a gradual process, right? You, you develop the path as you go a little bit, uh, but, but there's, uh, there's a clear need to make a, a wider path, uh, a stronger path. Okay, there is one more question here for you uh, in terms of which, which type of safety testing you are planning to do. Yeah. Uh, on the details of that, I would have to point to the <clears throat> project partners who are going to do the safety testing. Um, okay. uh, but, it, but it will be the, uh, I mean, the, in, in terms of mRNA, 
the safety is often less problematic if you look away from the immunogenicity than it would be for small molecules. Small okay. molecules have all kinds of nasty side effects. Whereas one of the real benefits of mRNA is that it's really extremely precise. So, so we, I, I guess we foresee that the, I mean, the complement activation is obviously one. Okay. Um, but we, I think we foresee that safety, once the platform is established, is likely to be somewhat less of a problem than it would be if you have a platform versus more molecules. Okay, so meaning that would be an advantage in that case for the testing. Okay. So we are at the end of this session. Um, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, even we had not the opportunity to have a coffee together in Basel. Um, and let's hope that uh, for the next CLIAM conference, if uh, Beat is going to do a next approach uh, next year, uh, that we have the option to see each other uh, and to exchange some more uh, thoughts and information. So I wish you all good health. Uh, <clears throat> I think a phrase we hear a lot of times uh, at this moment. Um, thank you very much again and uh, hopefully see you next year. Thank you.